Okay, welcome back. Uh, we have spent um, several lectures talking about the primal dual algorithm. And uh, in the last lecture, we saw the primal dual algorithm applied to shortest path. Now we're going to see the primal dual algorithm applied to the max flow problem. So uh, let me remind you um, about uh, the max flow problem. There is th This is more than just yet another application of primal dual. It, it's, it's going to show um, the overall methodology of combinatorializing, but we're going to see it in a different way because the, uh, the max flow problem, as we've seen, is the following. Maximize v is a new variable. It's not my flow variable. Uh, we've talked a little bit about max flow in, in the previous lecture. Subject to af plus dv equals zero, where d is equal to um, plus one, minus one, and zeros. Um, where this is the S row, this is the T row. Sorry, I think my convention previously was having a minus and a plus here because I brought it over to the left. Uh, and, then, and then zeros for all other nodes. Remember that uh, A is my flow matrix. L look back at previous lectures, the network flow lecture in particular that defines A, which is the, the, uh, the node arc or node edge incidence matrix. So an entry of, uh, of A is either plus one or minus one, whether a node, a directed arc terminates in that node or leaves that arc or leaves that node and zero if that particular edge that corresponds to a column doesn't uh, touch that doesn't touch that node uh, and my first two rows are are the ones for my source and sink s and t max flow also has the, an s and, and t just like shortest path and as i've commented before this equality sign here i will sometimes write as an inequality and I leave it to you to convince yourself that the problems are equivalent, whether it's written as an equality uh, or an inequality. This is special, obviously not generically true that equality constraints can be swapped with inequality constraints. It's because of the flow conservation constraints that this equation is expressing. Um, F is capacitated. Uh, that is different from the shortest path. In shortest path, we had a cost in each edge. But now Fij is at most Bij. Bij is some non-negative capacity. And F is itself uh, non-negative. Note that I'm, you'll see in a second why I'm writing it like this. So our cost is already combinatorialized. This is not like shortest path. Our cost is just one times uh, my variable V. V is going to be the solution. It's going to be how much flow I can send through. Um, so here it is B. It's the right-hand side that I want to combinatorialize. So our approach is just going to be to, to use duality. Rather than treat this as the primal in the primal dual flow, we're going to treat this as though this is, <clears throat> this is already the dual of uh, some problem. So that's, that, that, is the, that, that is our idea. So in the primal dual flow, we're going to treat this maximization problem as though it is already the dual of some primal that actually is not really important to us at the current time. If you look back at the primal dual algorithm, we're really only looking at the dual and the dual of the restricted primal, D and DRP. We are conceptually get building the flow by, by going from D to the restricted primal to the dual of the restricted primal, but actually what the algorithm, all the algorithm needs is an initial feasible dual solution that we've called P, a solution that we've called P bar to the dual restricted primal, and then you know, the new, the next P is P is P plus theta P bar, and so on, and, 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 and it goes on like that. So we don't we have never actually used the solution to the restricted primal. And so the the kind of the idea here is that we're going to combinatorial as the right hand side by just treating this as the dual. And that is also why I wrote it in this, um, in this way, because now I've, I've written a bunch of inequality constraints. And if I were to also write, you know, F is otherwise free, other than the constraints that I've written, this exactly has 
uh, the formulation of a dual to a problem, to a pro some primal problem in a standard, in standard form. Okay, so again, it's just conceptually, it's, it's matching up the way that, that we had before. Okay, so uh, this is, so let me just quickly summarize that. Um, we want to combinatorialize the right-hand side constraint B. Hence, we treat this as this meaning this as the dual problem. Whereas in uh, shortest path, we wrote down the shortest path, that was our primal, and we looked, and then we started the whole procedure, took the dual, found a feasible solution, and etc. Et, et okay, so uh, what is, um, yeah, I guess this is just what I, what I, what I said, uh, max flow as, as, as the dual. Um, so what is the next step of the primal dual algorithm? The next step of the primal dual algorithm is to find what the DRP is, the dual to the restricted problem. Um, so we need to uh, we need to write down what is the set J of tight constraints in the dual. So this is the index of. I, I guess I, uh, I'm, I'm skipping a step. Let me move that. Let me move that down. What we need is a we need a dual feasible solution, and then given a dual feasible solution, which we've typically called P, but in this case we're going to call F because this is our our flow our flow variables. Then we're going to write down uh, J, which is of course a function of that uh, that initializing feasible a uh, dual feasible solution, and it's going to be the uh, index of the dual constraints. Uh, again, dual for us right now means that primal uh, max flow problem. The dual constraints that are tight. If we were going through the entire conceptual process of writing down what the restricted primal was, we're just going to skip that step now. Um, J is the index of the only primal variables that are allowed to be different from zero. Uh, but we're just going to skip skip that and write down now what is the dual restricted problem. And you can see, look back, and you'll you'll, you'll see what the, the pattern uh, max v subject to a f plus d v and now instead of having this be less than that right hand side which would have been the cost of that primal problem which we're skipping that becomes a zero and that is the entire story of combinatorializing um and uh, again, note that I don't drop any of these variables because, as we discussed, any dual feasible solution satisfies AF plus DV less than or equal to zero. It satisfies that with, uh, sorry, less than or equal to B. It satisfies that with equality for, uh, for, for every constraint. These are the flow conservation constraints. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm sorry, I misspoke. There was no B there. Th this is the part where I used to have a B here, so this is, uh, now B is gone. I'm sorry, uh, AF plus DV less than zero is what we had in the original dual. And my point is that because all of those constraints are tight, they are all going to appear exactly as in the same way in the, uh, in the, in the dual restricted problem. Um, now, B is, you know, note that B is gone here. Uh, I didn't want to write that um, quite, quite. Uh, let me put that over over there, just in parentheses. B is gone. Uh, F is less than or equal to zero, but this is um, this is for rows where that uh, where the constraint F less than B in the in the original dual problem was tight. So in other words, for rows where F is equal to b in the dual and then i still have all my constraints 
uh, minus f less than or equal to zero, I also have the constraint f less than or equal to one. So try to look back at the primal dual and derive this for yourself so that you know how the mechanism works. And v is less than or equal to one. So remember wh wh where did uh, where do these um, where do these come from? Okay, so um, we start with f. We've written down the DRP. Now, what do we want to do? Well, again, similar to shortest path, we know v, if, if, if v is equal to zero in the optimal solution, then we know that we have an optimal, so we have an optimal solution because v equals zero by strong duality means that the restricted primal had an, had an optimal solution whose value was zero. If the restricted primal has an optimal solution whose value is zero, all of the auxiliary variables that we had to introduce are not present in that solution, which means we found the primal has a feasible solution which satisfies complementary slackness, and we're done. That F that we started with is optimal. So otherwise, uh, the restricted primal has a strictly positive optimal solution and optimal value, and, and so does DRP. And if DRP is positive, it means V is basically going to be one. You can see that that's, there's nothing else. It's not going to be like a third or a half or some other value. V is one. And so similarly to what we did with our, uh, with, with the um, shortest path problem, we can say, you know, what is the DRP solution going to be? Again, if V is equal to zero, it means F was optimal and the algorithm terminates. But otherwise, what, what does it take to set uh, v equal to one? Let's look back, let me flip back and see what does it take in order for v to equal one. In the shortest path, we had this essentially reachability problem where we labeled all nodes in, in, in shortest path, our dual variables were just one variable for every node. Here it is a little bit different. We have a variable for every edge. Um, but, uh, and we're, we're going to see this in more detail when we talk about the Ford Fulkerson labeling algorithm. But looking here, you can see that, um, that solving this DRP with V equal to one and writing down what the flow conservation constraints are, right? these are flow conservation, what happens if V is equal to one? Just, you know, go ahead and set V equal to one. And you're going to see that V can be equal to one only if there is a path on uh, from S to T. So let me write this down. To set V equals to one, there must be a path from S to T. And what is it allowed to use? Again, let me um, flip back again. And so it is, um, oh, and, and I'm sorry, I, I, I also have to write down at minus F is less than or equal to zero only for rows where F is equal to zero in D. So this uh, this path, what must it uh, what must it use? Um, this path from S to T. Uh, there must be a path from S to T that uses saturated arcs, in other words, F equals B, uh, sorry, arcs where F i j was equal to B i j in the original, in D, in the backward direction, and on the previous page, that corresponded to the constraint that F, I'm going to use bar for the solution to this DRP, uh, was less than zero, flipping back. Again, that's that's this. And that's saying that 
Yes, you're allowed to use those arcs, but they have to be in the backward direction. F has to be negative or non-positive. And, and this path has to use uh, arcs with zero flow. In other words, F equals zero, F I J equals zero in the dual problem in the forward direction. This is saying that F has to be, F bar has to be non-negative, which I wrote as minus F bar less than zero. So let's see that constraint that's here. Minus F is less than zero for arcs that had zero flow. And uh, all other arcs can be used in either direction. And other arcs in either direction. So this is now a problem where we've gotten rid of the B. It's just uh, telling us what we are allowed to use. So we're going to look uh, in more detail on how this gives the Ford Fulkerson algorithm. So I'm not going to talk about it too much here. We're going to pick this up uh, in, the, in the next lecture when we talk about this, how to find this algorithm in, in more detail.